Hey everybody, uh, so today we are talking um, a little bit more about reading instruction um, as it pertains to those with physical and health disabilities. Um, and you may ask yourself a question of, you know, why do students with physical disabilities have trouble with literacy? Um, and this model we're going to talk a little bit about kind of gives us some of those answers. So the, the um, estimation is about 50 to 90 percent of kids with physical disabilities read below grade level or even not at all. Um, when those kids have speech and physical impairment. So that's a pretty high percentage of kids um, who have uh, difficulty with reading. So this model that you're looking at on the screen is the physical and health disabilities performance model. And if you kind of take a look, it kind of has three different categories. So up here we have type of disability. So if you look, there's all different kinds of types. Um, we have functional effects, and then we have this psychosocial and environmental factors. And all of these things kind of come into play as to why students with physical disabilities or health disabilities um, may struggle with literacy. So um, type of disability is, you know, exactly what it sounds like. So kids might have um, neuromotor impairments like cerebral palsy, for example. Uh, they might have a degenerative or terminal disease um, like muscular dystrophy. We might have kids who have certain health impairments. So kids who have um, sickle cell where they'll be out of school a lot or they may be lethargic or tired. So depending on the type of disability, um, that student's individual ability to um, perform is going to vary based on what their disability is. Then we also have the functional effects of a kid's disability. So we have things that, like sensory loss. So students who have spina bifida we know have sensory loss um, in different parts of their body. Kids who have um, issues like, let's say, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy are going to have issues with fatigue and lack of endurance, and they can only perform for so long before they're going to need a break. So there's all these different functional effects that go um, along with the disability that are going to cause students to perform um, differently than their typically developing peers. Uh, and then thirdly, we have these other factors over here on the side. So uh, things like motivation can be a big problem for some of these students, okay? And your kids who have a terminal illness may not be motivated to perform in school. Um, we have, may have kids who deal with other things like, um, let's see, the physical environment. So just my inability to successfully navigate my environment is going to affect the way that I receive my education. So when you think about this model, you kind of have to think about how all these pieces kind of come together um, to affect the performance of kids with physical and health disabilities. Now, obviously, there are things that we do as teachers to combat each of these. Uh, you know, for example, um, kids who have maybe they have a sensory issue and they have a, a like a vision um, a vision deficit. So we might enlarge print or use boldface font uh, to help kids read certain things. For kids who have um, problems with communication, obviously we have the use of AAC. Um, we might have um, students who have Restricted, restricted range as far as the mobility, so we're going to arrange their environment in a way that they can more easily access their materials. So there's lots of different things that we do um, to kind of help um, with these things, but the, the main point of this is to look at this from a multimodal kind of perspective, as it's not just I have cerebral palsy, but there's all sorts of other factors that go into it and the way that it affects me um, and my ability to learn and function in my school environment. So in regards to physical disabilities, there are six physical efficiency areas that can impact a student's learning. Uh, and really when we say physical efficiency, we're talking about how well a student can physically manipulate materials and tools that are used in the classroom, as well as adaptations that need to be considered to improve their overall physical functioning. Um, so in regards to mobility, uh, we have difficulty moving around independently. Okay, so if you have a student with mobility problems, you may have to bring material um, to them. Right? They may not be able to access things as easily as other students in the class. Uh, student positioning. So a student may require adaptive seating. Um, you may have to look at different types of adaptive seating to find what fits the student best. Um, they may have to be uh, positioned um, throughout their day in different ways so that they don't um, get pressure sores or other things that can affect their health. And so that will play into the educational time that they have and how they're educated differently in certain parts of your classroom. Uh, motor movement, yeah, so some students are gonna have difficulty with fine motor, or they may be um, weaker in certain areas. So depending upon where the student has trouble, 
You may look at certain adaptations that we've talked about already in the semester, such as modifying the table surface for them. Um, maybe you need a slant board. Maybe you need something to help stabilize their paper. Range of motion um, simply means where is their range of motion in regards to what they can access and what they can't. So um, a lot of students who have physical disabilities are going to have some sort of limitation in their range of motion. So maybe they have use of both of their arms, um, but they have cerebral palsy and because of the spasticity in their muscles, they can't fully extend their arms and reach um, into, what a, into a normal area around themselves you would, would be considered. Um, so when you're dealing with range of motion issues, you have to think about how you're going to optimally place uh, items and materials that the students are working with. When we talk about fatigue and endurance, um, this is just simply does that student have a problem with that? So um, how long can a student work or write um, or participate in conversation before they become fatigued? Um, and this is something that you need to know about your students with physical disabilities in order to give them appropriate breaks um, so they don't get too tired um, but also making sure that you're challenging them enough. And then in regards to communication, does the student require some sort of augmentative communication? Um, do they have some sort of speech impairment? Um, and how are you going to meet those needs? So those are the six areas um, that can impact learning based on what kind of deficits or skills the students have in each of those areas. Reliable means of response is such an important piece of educating students um, who have speech uh, impairment. So, when we say, does a student have a reliable means of response, it simply means, do they have a way of communicating which those around them will understand? Uh, this is one of the first things that I like to ask teachers or adults when I come across a student with a, a speech disability, and I will say, you know, what's their yes, no? How do they say, um, how do you know they're enjoying something? What ways do they communicate in which you know is reliable? Um, so in order for students with severe speech and physical disabilities to participate, um, we must first know their reliable means of response, and if they don't have one, we must teach it. Um, it's really determined by the consistency of the response. Um, sometimes students will have an isolated movement, so they might uh, raise their right arm to say yes. Um, they might put their head down to say no. Um, some students will use a blinking um, mechanism that they'll blink um, if they mean yes, they'll blink twice if they mean no. Um, so it really varies based on the student. Um, some students will actually be able to touch and access something. So maybe they have um, a picture card that they touch to communicate. We've come across some students whose response um, was sticking their tongue out if they uh, were communicating yes to something. Um, now, it's important with reliable means of response that we ensure that errors that the students make are learning errors and not a mode or movement error. So, for example, um, sometimes uh, I'll be out in a classroom and I'll watch a, a teacher work with a student and maybe a student is selecting um, a button on an AAC device in which there's, you know, there's two buttons um, and they're relatively close together. And it's hard to tell if the student um, made an error because they really selected the wrong um, item or if they made an error because their motor movements um, are not as defined as they need to be, if that makes sense. So essentially what you need to do is at first, uh, particularly, you need to have your options spread apart if you're having the student do some sort of motor movement to select an item. That way um, it's, there's no question as to whether or not the student, what they meant by their motor movement. Uh, whereas when you have two items closely together and students try to select, it's very easy to pick one over the other um, accidentally. So hopefully by now in the semester you guys all are well aware of AAC um, and well aware that AAC can be used to promote literacy for students. Um, so when we talk about AAC to promote literacy, um, one of the big things is how is the AAC device actually programmed? Um, I hate it when I go out and I see a student using an AAC device and it's just not really appropriate for the student. Um, sometimes they're just too complicated. Sometimes they're just not even arranged in a good way, especially if we have a, um, a device in which, you know, it's, it's a multi-page device where you hit one button and it leads you in, you in a whole other page. Um, so you really have to ask yourself, is this set up um, to promote literacy for the student in a logical way that makes sense? So for example, if you're using your AAC device 
um, and you want to have have kind of um, activities that go along with what you're doing in your classroom. Well, if the students in the classroom are studying Treasure Island, then the AAC device needs information on it regarding Treasure Island, whether it's um, the story uh, of itself, maybe it can be read through the AAC device, maybe there's a specific page of vocabulary from the story in which the student can um, answer comprehension questions from. So it should be programmed basically to meet the specific needs of the student at that time. Um, and you might say, well, that takes a lot of time. And yes, it does. So um, it's something that should be strategic in that it's done um, in a way that you know, students are going to use it to maximize their time. So, you know, if you're going to be working on you know, Treasure Island for the month of October, well, that's well worth your time to program a page on that device to correlate with that story for the student to use um, in order to promote their literacy. There are certain things to consider when you're setting up um, your AAC device to promote literacy. So one of the things is ensuring that um, your words in relation to your graphic symbols are, um, are sized well. So um, with your simple AAC systems, you want to make sure that you have the word um, above your picture and that the word is large enough that the student can notice and see it. Um, particularly if your goal is to teach the student to read the word eventually as opposed to the picture. So you want to make sure that um, the word is big enough if we're going to fade those pictures out um, to where they're going to read the words alone um, at a later time. Secondly, you want to ask yourself, well, can the student answer and ask questions regarding reading and literacy from the AAC device? Um, so is there a, maybe a generic reading page where they could ask questions um, like, you know, who are the main characters? Um, can you repeat the conclusion of the story? Things along that nature. Um, or is maybe there a more specific page, like what we talked about early with specific um, qualities about the story Treasure Island, for example, if that's what you're doing. So here's a, kind of an example of a generic reading page that might be on a student's AAC device. So um, for initiate, you might it might verbalize, um, you know, want book, more book, please read book. Okay, so these are all ways that students could initiate um, opening of a book or a book being brought to them so that they could read. So there's items for group participation. So ask me, um, me next, I like that, you next, all examples of that. Um, ways for the student to get assistance, so turn the page. Clarification and then areas for them to comment and ask others. So this is a good um, setup if you're looking for kind of just a generic um, reading page for a student to put on their device. And thirdly, you uh, need to ask yourself, is this system being used to teach specific um, reading or writing lessons? So you could use um, a word family activity that's shown up below where um, this is the at family, the student selects M and it reads Matt, or the student selects C and it reads Cat. Okay, so just ways to teach um, more of a phonic kind of approach to students, um, activities they use to, um, as kind of like a supplemental instruction activity. The fourth consideration, and this is a more complex, um, is there opportunity for sentence construction or vocabulary development? Okay, so if a student um, is at a place where they can construct sentences, and this is something they need to start working on, then it's something that can be included in their AAC as a way to promote literacy. Now, there are certain programs that allow you to construct sentences um, or vocabulary. Um, writing the symbols is one of those programs that can do that. Um, or you can actually create picture symbols. And if you're going to create your own, you just want to make sure, again, that the font is large, um, there's emphasis on the word as opposed to an emphasis on the picture. This uh, consideration also is uh, more advanced, uh, and it's looking at does the A system have linguistic features? So does it um, allow to change the verb tenses? Does it allow for plurality, um, for example, um, making you know words past tense to add an ED, um, plural, adding S's, those sorts of things. Um, does it have that ability when you're considering teaching literacy to students who are um, have a physical disability but may be um, cognitively in a normal range? Then we have the consideration of is there an alphabet page that will promote spelling or promote writing for the student? Um, if you think back to our visit to Georgia Tools for Life, um, there were different keyboard layouts that we saw. So you have the typical um, QWERTY layout, um, there's also an ABC layout. Um, there's different keyboards that are, make it easier for students to type. There's a one-handed keyboard. So it um, depends on the, 
the nature of the student and their disability, uh, but there are different ways to display keyboards that may be more beneficial to one student and help them learn quicker. Um, so these are kind of things that you must consider if you're going to put um, kind of an alphabet page on the device. Does the AAC device interface with the computer? Right? So this is an important consideration again for students um, and maybe they're working on typing so can they type um, it'll interface with the computer to where they can uh, import into a program like Microsoft Word to type a report. So now we're going to talk a little bit about using symbols to support um, to promote literacy. So you guys probably all are aware that symbols can be used to teach words, um, something that we do commonly when we're working with kids with more significant cognitive disabilities. Um, and the strategy basically is that we pair our word um, with a symbol and then we slowly fade it away. So we do things like we make the word larger, the symbol smaller, um, we cover the picture, we gradually, gradually fade that away until only the word is left, um, and making the word bolder, making the picture lighter. So all different ways to kind of fade out the picture support and have the student concentrate solely on the word itself. So symbols, um, that's just say used, not sued, my apologies. Um, symbols can be used, I'll go ahead and just change that, um, to assess comprehension. So we have the word cat and then the student will match cat, the picture of a cat to the word. Symbols can be used to teach comprehension. So you have a maybe a picture dictionary. So let's say the student sees the word bird and they are unclear on what the meaning of bird is. They could look at the word up in the picture dictionary and it will show them the picture. So now they know that this word is bird because they're familiar with the picture of a bird. Now they can match it to the word. When we're talking about uh, teaching students with physical and health disabilities, to read, there's lots of things that we must consider. And um, obviously from what we've talked about already, we've talked about different AAC, the use of pictures and symbols, um, all the things that we know that can affect these students. Um, there's also things just as simple as how we're gonna modify a book um, to make it more accessible. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can do. Um, one thing for our students who may have um, issues with mobility, their range of motion, um, with their vision, would be to change the size of the book. Okay, so, so for some students, simply changing the size um, is enough to modify the book for them to access it. Um, page fluffers are really big, especially with our kids who are going to have um, some sort of physical disability that affects their fine motor skills with their hands. And so if you look at this picture, um, this is an example of page fluffers. And this is, if you look really closely, you can see a paper clip. Um, and the paper clip is attached to a little piece of paper that has a little piece of foam on it. Um, so it's just enough to kind of literally fluff the page up so students can reach in and turn the page without having to have that fine motor ability to grab the page by itself. Uh, real easy, really inexpensive thing to do to help our students. Um, putting books on computer is a huge thing. Uh, very easy, um, can be done um, and probably actually is a lot of books are available on the computer already that you can download uh, but having the visual of the book having the book um, be read to them by, via the computer um, is a great way to make them make it more accessible and if you remember um, that's one of the things that Georgia Tools for Life works on is putting books on computer and scanning books in um, enlarging and changing the font size so making it bigger um, maybe making it uh, bold versus um, so that it stands out more for students with visual impairments. Uh, adding symbols to each word, so again, writing with symbols is one of those programs that if you uh, type a book into writing with symbols, it'll put a symbol with each word that can be really helpful for our students who have maybe lower cognitive functioning. So some students uh, are going to have trouble fo basically following a line of print, uh, and we know that a strategy that we teach kids is to follow a line with their finger. Well, if I have a physical disability, it might be much harder for me to take my finger and track what I'm reading. Um, so one thing that, that you can do is a, a color line prompting strategy. Um, and basically what it is, it's using um, two different colors and you draw a line between two lines of text and initially the color kind of will change back and forth often which will help the student to track um, until it gets, uh, eventually will get just the one color mm -hmm. will get longer. Um, and the first line, uh, basically, that you're going to track from the color line below, and the next line you're going to track above. So it's one line between 
that you can essentially track two lines of print with. Um, so it's just one way to help students um, not to lose their place when they're reading from one, um, one, one line to the next. Um, and then if they have trouble when they're moving from the end of one line to the beginning of the next, you can use kind of an alternating color um, where they follow from blue, then they're going to switch to orange. Then the next line will be blue again, then the next line will be orange to kind of help them go from one end to the, of the end to the beginning of the next without losing their spot. So when we talk about emergent literacy, um, we're really talking about the literacy that takes place typically um, from birth to preschool. Now, depending on the level of the students that you teach, um, you may have kids that are in high school that are working on emergent literacy, literacy skills. Um, so some things that fall within this category are um, understanding rhyming words, um, and being able to identify letters, being able to identify um, words on a page, um, understanding logos within the community, um, and the reading abilities of children who are not yet um, conventional readers really fall up under this category. So if you have a student who you say, yeah, they're not a reader in the conventional sense, those students are working on emergent literacy skills. Um, so, so things that we might work on in our classrooms would be um, book knowledge. So how do you hold a book? How do you open a book? Um, what's in a book? How do we um, create a story? Um, print awareness in and of itself, uh, phonological awareness, as well as alphabet knowledge. So letter sounds, how to blend, um, and even looking more functionally at things like logos within the community and identifying um, pictures and sight words all would fall up under emergent literacy. As far as uh, book and print awareness, these are all great skills to be working on with your students, uh, particularly if you have certain times of your day where you read. Um, so teaching students how to open a book, where you start, how you read from left to right, um, pointing out certain things to them as you read throughout the book. Um, storybook reading with adaptations, so you can read predictable books, um, pattern books, journals for students. Um, another thing that I really like within emergency literacy is the use of wordless books um, and having students um, create or embellish a story um, as you go along. So um, having them select certain things that they think might happen next based on the picture in the book and elaborating on that. Uh, repeated readings or repetitive books, um, you can adapt using a Big Mac switch. This is a great thing to do in your classroom. Um, you have a you know, student who can select the switch, um, which will read the repetitive ending um, of the book. So if you have a book that your kids love to read, uh, you program the switch and then allow them to participate in that way. Um, it's great to predict what happens next. Again, you can use an AAC device for this. Um, you can have multiple um, devices programmed, or you can have a step-by-step -step in which um, a different um, statement will be read each time the switch is um, activated. So you can just kind of read those with your classroom. Um, interactive books, so you can have books um, that students can interact with more. You can have books that are on the computer that they access. That, so maybe you have a book and, and it's the three little pigs and when um, the wolf blows the house down on the computer, the house actually falls down. So ways that the students can kind of see the story come to life. Um, when we talk about phonemic awareness, we really mean um, the student's ability to discriminate, identify, and manipulate individual sounds that are in spoken words. And then, of course, beginning phonics is the ability for our students to match letter sound correspondences, uh, begin to learn to blend and segment sounds in order to make words. Now, it's important to talk about scaffolding when we're talking about reading. Um, scaffolding instruction is exactly what it sounds like. It takes instruction and breaks it down for students um, to, in a way that it meets their needs. Um, so if we think about the zone of proximal development, what you know is that spot um, with the distance between our actual developmental level um, of independent performance and our potential, right? And so our instructional level is an area between our independent level and our frustration level. Um, so we want to make sure that we're challenging students enough um, that they can learn, but they're also not too frustrated. Um, so we know we have to be in that zone in order to teach students. Um, and this is kind of all based off of Vygotsky's sociocultural learning theory. Uh, if you're familiar with reading recovery, it's one of the programs out there that uses scaffolding instruction. Um, so that might be a good program to look into, particularly if you're working with students who are a little bit um, 
higher cognitively and are going to be working more on um, those phonemic awareness and phonics skills. Uh, reading recovery might be a good program to take a look at. Another uh, great approach to basic reading is self-regulated learning. Um, so within self-regulated learning, students direct their own thought and action towards goals. So essentially um, what it is is kind of a student taking control. Um, Self-instruction uh, is when students learn to verbalize the steps. When um, So maybe they're learning to solve a math problem and they actually verbalize the steps of solving the problem um, while they're working through it. Okay. Um, Self-monitoring is exactly what it sounds like. So it's maybe a student checks off um, boxes when they're actively engaged in reading um, during a reading lesson. Um, Self-reinforcement. Students reinforce themselves for meeting certain goals. So, you know, self-reinforcement and self-monitoring kind of kind of go together. So I self-monitor um, my attention level or my, I self-monitor the steps to complete my math problem, and then I self-reinforce when I meet those. So these are all parts of self-regulated learning. These first three that I just talked about um, essentially come from the theory of behaviorism, uh, which we all know is a theory that we operate out of, particularly in the field of special education. Um, these last four are more um, from the information processing theory. So uh, we teach students rehearsal, which is repeating information, the ability to summarize information, um, elaboration. So how do you use um, imagery, using mnemonics, using questioning to learn material. Um, organization, where students are um, mapping things using concepts, maps, or charts, um, grouping. And then comprehension, uh, monitoring. So my ability to um, reread material if I don't understand, self-question, um, and paraphrase information that I've learned. Direct instruction is a really common uh, approach to reading. This is actually the reading approach I was trained on when I was in college. Um, and it essentially um, is, a, is exactly what it sounds. It's very direct and systematic. So the skills um, in regards to reading are broken down into really small parts, and they're taught um, through lessons that are scripted. So they're highly structured um, and they're in a logical sequential order. Um, so the teacher actually will ha typically have a lesson that says exactly what they're supposed to say and exactly how the student will respond. Um, there's a focus on antecedent prompts and then there's a, an embedded kind of a model. I model, I prompt you, and then I give you feedback. Um, the lessons are very teacher directed. So it's, it's very different from um, the self-regulated learning we just talked about to where this is very teacher directed. Uh, not student directed. Um, so there's a couple DI programs out there. You may have heard of Reading Mastery um, as well as Corrective Reading and both of those um, reading programs are direct instruction based. So great programs to look at if you're working um, with teaching students with physical and health disabilities. And again, um, this approach as well as all the other approaches we have talked about can be used with the nonverbal reading approach that we learned about last week. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about this material, you would take the nonverbal reading approach and apply to a program like corrective reading if you wanted to use direct instruction. The last approach that we're going to talk about is balanced literacy. Um, again, this is another program um, and it looks more kind of holistically at literacy. Um, so you could have these four blocks um, uh, and you have so guided reading, which essentially includes some sort of shared reading. So maybe it's a, um, a big book that the students are going to read together. Um, the students participate in the readings, they might do a picture walk, um, there might be a partner reading involved, and then there's self-selected reading, um, where the teacher does a read aloud, so it may be five to ten minutes, um, then there's independent reading, uh, a section where a student and a teacher will kind of conference, so the teacher calls a student over, they read a couple of pages, the teacher makes notes, um, and then a reader's chair, and so each day the student, a couple of children will share with the class about what they've been reading. Um, then there's a, a session, a section about working with words. So it might be um, a word wall where five high frequency words are added each week. Um, there might be a making words activity where children are given consonant letters and a set of vowels and they kind of create their own words. Um, and then there's a writing block. So some sort of mini lesson on writing and an opportunity for the children to write. So this approach is a little bit more um, all-encompassing as opposed to just focusing on reading um, also ties in a writing aspect to it as well.